three of the 2020 Black Philanthropy Month Lunch and Learn six-part webinar series. It has been a journey already. We've heard from some exciting, informative uh, folks, and uh, I'm really, really excited about today as well. Uh, before we get started, I want to remind every folk, everybody that this event is presented by Black Funders of St. Louis. We are a local giving circle. Our members are Black people from all walks of life who agree to make an annual contribution of $300 or more, which is then pooled together with donations from non-members and allies of racial equity to award grants to Black-led nonprofits in St. Louis every year. Uh, since 2017, we have awarded more than $10,000 to local organizations. In addition, we as members are encouraged to offer our time and talent to support Black-led nonprofits in the community. Our work is rooted firmly in the pursuit of racial equity and a fair St. Louis. If you'd like to learn more about us, our grant cycle, giving circles, and this webinar series, I'd ask you to visit our website, which is blackfundersstl.com. I'd also like to acknowledge our fiscal sponsor at this time, Deaconess Foundation, which is providing technical assistance for all of the webinars that you have been attending and will be attending. Uh, today's session is called The Leaders We Need, Nonprofit Board Development. We are joined by the fantastic nationally recognized trainer and Marissa Q. Payne. Uh, Marissa is a master facilitator, organizational change consultant, and love and leadership coach. She is hopelessly addicted to helping others. She is certified to administer leadership, team, and workplace assessments, and has additional certifications in governance training, which we'll be dealing with today, social and emotional intelligence, and change management, which we'll also be talking about a little today. In addition, for almost a decade, Ms. Payne has been helping establish women presidents, CEOs, and other executive leaders in the nonprofit sector who are ready to make shifts to drive change in their organizations and communities and lead more courageously. Last but not least, she and her husband co-host the podcast, Life, Love, and Leadership with Dr. James and Marissa Q. Payne. Marissa, welcome to the Lunch and Learn series. How are you? I am fantastic and super excited about this discussion. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to let you do your thing. Awesome. Awesome. So hello, everyone. And thanks so much for joining us. I, um, as Brandon mentioned, I have a diverse interests, as you can tell. But um, I must say that uh, boards of directors and governance, um, particularly in an equity space, is one of my favorite topics. So I'm super, super excited to be sharing with you. I will tell you right now that I need you to engage with me um, and talk back to me. I'm excited to um, answer your questions. And so um, by all means, as we sort of dig into the content, be ready to um, ask me questions because that energizes me um, and really uh, helps me be more effective. I am going to share my screen and we are going to uh, jump in. Um, just, let's see, give me one second. There we go. Um, I did want to just provide a little context. Um, I like to do that um, because I have a bias, right? So, so you know a little bit more about my background and where I'm coming from on this topic. I um, have a very d diverse career. I sort of started in corporate America and, and during that time I was an avid volunteer. Um, I was a crisis hotline worker and a guardian ad litem, and I served on a number of different boards and advisory committees. And I really decided that that side of the world was the world that I really wanted to make my career. And so I shifted from corporate to the nonprofit sector. I got a master's degree in social work with the intention of leading nonprofit organizations, um, which I did for probably about 10 to 12 years or so. Um, working in program development and design, uh, community relations, and ultimately serving as an executive director of a few nonprofits before starting my consulting firm and focusing on um, organizational change. I was really, really fascinated by how organizations shifted, how they navigated change, and the role that leadership played in that space. 
Um, after about eight years now of working as a consultant and working with all types of organizations, both locally, regionally, and nationally, I have sort of, um, um, I would say, gathered <laughs> quite a bit of um, observation about um, organizations, um, those who serve Black communities in particular, and really today just wanted to have a conversation about those observations and what I see as barriers to effectiveness um, in that space. We are, um, our consulting firm, Pain Free Consulting, which is really in the midst of a shift um, from that brand to sort of the Marissa Q. Payne International brand, specifically because of a lot of the observation that I've had in seeing ineffective um, work, right, in communities at the helm of nonprofits. So there's a soapbox, right, about boards and their relevance in nonprofit organizations. And whether or not the law of the land, which originally established why we need a board for um, the nonprofit corporation type in the first place, is that model even still relevant? Because I have worked with a lot of executives, a lot of CEOs that, can we just be honest, hate their boards, right? Or the board is the bane of their existence, or they dread their board meetings, or they're so frustrated that the board isn't pulling their weight. Um, and, you know, so really it's like, what is the purpose of this board in the first place? And having done that, right, getting phone calls to say, can you come train our board, right, do a one to two hour workshop, which really doesn't solve the problem, but um, in hopes that somebody will get jazz and it will shift the whole culture was an unrealistic expectation. And so our firm is beginning to shift, right, from a transactional approach to really transformational. And instead of just working um, on one-offs, right, based on the request, that we're really interested in working deeper with organizations to truly, truly shift organizational cultures from the board, and I don't say from the top down, I really say just from the different roles within an organization, because can we be honest, the board of directors is not the top of an organization in an equity-centered model. Number, you know, that's a point right there, that the board of directors plays a role just like the executive does, the staff does, the clients do, the participants do, the funder does, other service providers do. There's this inner locking circle of folks who actually impact whether or not you're going to have impact right on the social problem that you're established to address and so if you're coming into this work with the idea or the notion that the board is the top um, you're challenged already and so we are shifting, and that's really kind of the heartbeat of what I want to talk about today is sort of what has been getting in the way in terms of governance um, that we can really change and shift to get um, greater impact from our organizations and greater impact for our communities. Um, so when it's done well, providing leadership as a nonprofit director can be one of the most powerful ways, I say powerful, to support and impact Black communities. Why do you say that, Marissa? Well, you get the opportunity to go deeper into the social problems that are plaguing communities, right? Really, really, if you're doing it effectively, you are paying attention to what's happening and really wrestling with the tension of available solutions, right? We're not doing just business as usual. We're not just doing it because it's the way it's always been done. We're actually having conversation, right? From my vantage point, I'm like, move the stupid boardroom table, right? Let's get away from the table and get into the community. Like, let's meet in a circle with just chairs. Let's meet um, in the spaces where um, our program is designed to serve, right? Get out of the ivory tower, so to speak, and actually wrestle with the tension so that we are aware of the impact and what we're really doing and whether or not it's making a hill of being a difference to begin with. 
right? As a nonprofit director, you get to rally resources, right? When you've done that work, you've researched the problem, you've wrestled with the tensions, you've designed with the participant in mind, you can rally resources, be an advocate, be an ambassador for good, um, and ensure, right, evaluate that it's done in an equitable and just way. That's amazing. Right? That's amazing. How many of you put it in the chat? Just talk back to me by chat because that's the best way we can do it. Um, just let me know if that's how your board is impacting the organization at this time. Let me know if that's how you're impacting. And if it's not, let me know what you think is the greatest barrier to that. Um, let me know if that's the greatest barrier, right? So let me know, yes, this is how our board is currently impacting or no, not yet. And what's getting in the way? I want to give you a minute to respond to that. What is getting in the way? I see that. I see some questions coming in already. Thank you. But that's why I love boards, right? So let's talk about um, when it doesn't happen. Well, I'll give you guys a chance. I see some comments. Not yet. Not really. Um, boards can stretch a little bit. Yep. I see you all. Thank you. Good, good, good. I see some good board comments as well. Yes, this is how we're acting. Good. Okay, so let's talk about some of the things I've observed in time that says, um, I've called them sort of three solvable symptoms of ineffective boards, right? Again, I have worked with a lot of boards over the past 15, 20 years, and really a lot of those challenges can be clustered um, down to really three symptoms, generally speaking, when we get um, calls. They can be reduced to kind of three areas, um, and we're going to talk about that. So the first one um, is going through the motions, right? Going through the motions, and that is a little bit of a play on words. So again, share with me in the chat, how many of you use Robert's rule of order? as the rule of order for your board of directors. Just type a one if you use Robert's rules. One, 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 yep. I see several ones coming in. Anybody don't not use that or use something different, you can give me a zero. I see somebody saying the board resisted, yes. <laughs> Right, so going through the motions, I move, so moved, et cetera. One of the things we notice is that oftentimes, right, boards, particularly for or long standing, long tenured organizations, um, and even newer organizations, at the risk of um, just sort of knowing that there's a legal obligation, we just do things because we've been doing things. Um, and accepting Robert's rules, for example, who knows who Robert is, right? Did you know that they're on the 11th edition and it's like over 600 pages um, in that edition? Generally speaking, for most organizations, Robert's rules, um, one, doesn't necessarily apply in terms of really strong decision making. Um, and generally speaking, the board is not trained, the officers aren't trained, the executive isn't trained, and so we sort of just know that there's some formality to how we're supposed to do this, and we just go along to get along. Um, and that can happen at the committee structure level. It can happen in so many ways, right? We just sort of go through the motions um, because this is the way we've been doing it, and this is the way it's been done, and it's not necessarily really, really serving the organization. Of course, there are legal responsibilities, right? Lots of them. There's laws and statutes, um, bylaws, and things of that nature that actually um, dictate how the board has to be structured. But beyond that, um, you know, a lot of times we just sort of go through the motions beyond that and just do it the way it's been done without ever uh, reinventing. I see that someone says, who is Robert anyway? Isn't he dead? Exactly. <laughs> um, no disrespect to um, his last name is Robert. I can't even think of his first name at the moment. <laughs> but it's from the 1800s, right? So yes, um, if we are just 
taking on these ideals and principles, right? It's time to reevaluate. So how do you do that, right? You need to actually focus on the areas that matter to your organization, right? So yes, the IRS. Yes, you need to review the 990, right? Yes, you have to have three officers by state statute, depending on which state you're in. Um, what are the other authority um, bodies that govern what you're supposed to do, supposed to do by law to fulfill your requirement? But that is really the starting point. Um, beyond that, oftentimes, you know, folks are get intimidated about this really powerful role because it seems so there's by laws, right? Anytime you get law, you feel legal and there's, you know, um, requirements. And yes, there are. And it's our responsibility, someone's responsibility to pay attention to that and to know that and to make sure everyone is informed about that so that we can actually show up fully and do what we need to do. Right. But beyond that, it's more than just roles. Right. It's also responsibility. So you start with the important sources of authority for your organization. Right. We have a phrase we like to say, you've seen one board, you've seen one board. So everyone is not the same, right? So you can't just take a template off the internet and apply it to your organization or take you know, a template from another organization. It's a starting point, but you really do have to have a conversation about what works and what's appropriate for your organization. Again, a starting point, right? After that, right, so we know that there's responsibilities, right? These are the things that foundational things that you generally know already, right? So individual board members versus the full board. This is something that shows up a lot um, where one particular board member or a long tenured board member really is kind of holding the power, so to speak. But generally speaking, not generally speaking, literally, Individual board members are just that, right? You as an individual board member have the duty of care, loyalty and obedience that you hear about so much, right? That you don't show up with conflict of interest, that you put in reasonable care, you read your information, you ask good questions um, and you follow the law. That's an individual board member's responsibility and you have one vote, right? One vote when it's bringing in issues to the organization, but ultimately it's the board, right, as, a, as, a, as an entity that actually is making the decisions on behalf of the organization. So individual board members influence um, and contribute to conversation, which is, that's where you want diversity right? Not just um, race, gender, but diversity in thought, diversity in perspective, um, which is something that you can really kind of screen and source for um, specifically because you really want to have thoughtful conversations, right? Again, scooting the board table away, but how are we actually engaging and talking about the issues that really matter? You want to be able to do that and then be able to rally that conversation in a way that's meaningful. Um, when we make a decision, we make a decision as a unified entity on behalf of the organization and ideally in concert with or in collaboration with the other people right that are also the other organizations and the other entities that are actually addressing um, these issues so um, another important thing to notice so more than a role it's a responsibility right it's a responsibility and so if it's not working if it doesn't make sense and you are on the board or you are um, the ceo working with the board, you have a responsibility for ensuring that you get to a place where the board is actually fulfilling a role that makes a difference in the organization. And it's different, right, than other roles that are being fulfilled. Again, not supreme, not superior per se, but different and meaningful and impactful. And that changes and it evolves. 
right? Organizations are organisms. And what you needed when you were in your first five years is different when you're in your 25th year and different when you're in your 65th year, et cetera. And so this is just kind of a model for, you know, the types of boards that might, um, how your board might evolve and what it might look like. And, you know, asking yourself, what do we need now? right? Not just going through the motions, but what do we need now at this time in the organization, right? Depending upon how staffed you are, you know, you have your executive, do you have a chief financial officer on staff determines how the treasurer's role may look? Do you have a chief program officer? If you don't have those roles, then some of that may be fulfilled through committee at the board level. If you do have those roles, then the board, you know, focuses on, may focus on policy and other issues, but really having a conversation as your organization grows and evolves about what role, in addition to the legal responsibilities and the fiduciary responsibilities, how do you actually impact this organization in a way that makes a difference, right? That's what draws and attracts great leaders, other people to want to actually be a part of something great. All right, I'm gonna pause for a moment because I know that was a lot of information. I'm gonna take a peek at the chat here, see what questions we have. Okay, so I see a question about um, gaps. Uh, this is really good. So gaps in uh, fundraising, um, maybe when you have an executive who may have gaps or, um, you know, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, um, but what do you do with gaps, uh, basically, whether it's with the executive or with the board? Um, and I think that, you know, this is actually a good slide to sort of be on because, um, like I said, the organization evolves, right? So yes, one of the board's responsibilities is to hire a chief executive and to support the chief executive and to evaluate the chief executive. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and if you identify a gap, ideally you work in partnership um, with the chief executive. And so thinking about the organization and its needs, um, in this season and at this time, if fundraising is a major priority for the organization and your executive does not necessarily have the skills for where you need, right? How, are, how is the board um, investing in its budget to ensure that the executive either, you know, gets the skills or, um, you know, you appoint, right, a resource, you add a resource to support it that the board um, re, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, recruits, right, um, your fund development committee um, to actually strengthen and balance that, that there's a dashboard put in place um, in terms of the performance, you know, standards and goals for the year that you set really clear expectations and that the chief executive can kind of determine how they're going to reach those goals. Um, either they do it themselves or they find a way to do it, but it's, it's, a, it's a partnership. Um, so there's a lot of ways to sort of I, to, to fill gaps. I think identification is the first step. Um, and then knowing that there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, sometimes, you know, you may, it's not uncommon for, um, you know, the organization's growth to sort of uh, outgrow, right, the skill set of either board or staff roles. And that's conversation that has to be had. Like the more we focus on the mission of the organization, the purpose that we're fulfilling in the community and less on the humans and the egos and the power structures and centers, that is really where a lot of organizations tend to get into trouble. Um, and really recruiting the kinds of people that sort of um, understand that and are willing to, you know, share power um, and that it's not, you know, you can sort of assess um, a board meeting. We do a lot of board meeting observation and pay attention 
to what's being discussed and the kinds of questions that are being asked and discussed. What are, you know, what's, are we talking about tablecloths and micromanaging from, you know, $5 here and $15 here? Are we talking about the impact of our program and is it really making a difference and what barriers are being put in place for the participants? How responsive are we being? All of those things, you know, you can tell a lot um, from that vantage point. I hope that helps. Um, I want to make sure I'm paying attention to my time also. Okay, good. We're doing okay. Oh, other questions I see. Jumpstarting committees for new or growing boards. Is it appropriate to have non-voting board members? Love that question. Again, you've seen one board, you've seen one board. So really the question is, what does our board need now? Right? So when you are just getting started, you are doing, you know, you're sort of at this coverall stage, right? Um, you're, there's a lot going on and sort of what are you focusing? Is the program well established? Are the services clear? Do you have the funding that you need? Um, so really thinking about and having a strategy, right? Um, so a goal for the, where you're going in the next 12 to 18 months at least. Um, and that you're always moving in that direction. Another opportunity for your board is that it's always working ahead, right? Assuming you have staff, right? Some organizations, when you're just getting started, you don't have staff. So you're doing both at the same time. You're working, um, you know, the now and you're working the future. Um, so it really, there's not necessarily always a right or wrong. It's really more about what we need at this time. I am a big fan of having non-board member members of some committees because I see it as a great pipeline for future board members, right? Um, bringing on board members is not something that should be done lightly um, because it is a, as we talked about, it's a powerful appointment and responsibility, emphasis on responsibility, and you want someone that's actually appreciates and understands the role and that they're actually going to give and contribute in the way that you really need them to. And the best way to know that, right, is a predictor from previous behavior. So you want to have seen them in action on behalf of the organization, if at all possible. Um, and if not, at least on behalf of somebody else's organization. So um, non-board committees is a great way to do that, or work groups or task forces is a great way to do that. Um, some, you know, so for example, your governance committee, which is usually responsible for kind of nominating, um, usually you don't have non-board member members on that committee, but you could, right? Again, if we get rid of kind of the white supremacist foundational views about how this is supposed to be structured and how power is supposed to be distributed, we can really free ourselves to being um, responsive to our mission. Um, governance is the work um, the board is just a structure to actually fulfill that. And in fact, it's only one piece, right? It's only one piece that here's really the definition, right? The governance is a system of interconnected roles and responsibilities, policies, practices delegated to shape and provide for the life and work of an organization while doing the stuff that we usually attribute to boards, right? The legal, ethical, and fiduciary compliance. Where is your board in this, right? Where are you in this? What do you focus on the most, right? What do you think about your board meetings, right? What's the agenda? What's holding the bulk of your agenda? Right? Is it shared space? Are you talking about the life and work of the organization? Right? The life cycle, where are we? Are you talking about, are you evaluating? Do you even get information about that? Are your policies, you know, have you reviewed them? Um, are they responsive to what's happening in the climate today? Who else is informing your decisions, right? It's interconnected. 
Do you know what other service providers are doing? Do you know what gap you're filling, right? And how effectively you're doing that? Where, what kind of data are you reviewing and evaluating, right? You are steering, governance is to steer, but in order to do that effectively, there's a lot of stuff you gotta know, right? About the landscape. So how is that happening? How is that happening? All right, number two, symptom number two is misguided focus, right? So we've talked about this a little bit and this can be rephrased in a number of different ways. It can be majoring in the minors. It can be focusing on the wrong thing. Um, but ultimately, ideally, right, it's getting really clear about what is the role of the board in this organization at this time and ensuring that we're designing um, the board in a way that ensures that it actually does that. Um, the governance as leadership model really is, is one model for trying to get to a place where we're doing this that like we talked about, that fiduciary legal responsibility is one portion, strategic, right? Where are we headed? Um, you know, what's the long-term um, kind of goals and strategies is a, a second part. And then the piece that is often um, less focused on, right, is the generative. Um, are we going to get into this area or aren't we and why, right? Um, I was just talking with um, an organization last week about um, whether or not, you know, they would uh, make a stance on Black Lives Matter, believe it or not, but that happens. And um, there were many in the organization, a philanthropic organization that did not want to do that. And so there was, um, that was an important moment, right, in society that needed to be discussed and uh, was really raised as an organizational issue. And this is an organization that has DEI as a priority, and yet we're having a conversation about whether or not we will take a, we will say Black Lives Matter, generative conversation. Um, and if we do, and if we don't, and what are the consequences there are, right? Sometimes this comes in in fundraising, who we take money from, who we don't take money from, um, what's our position there? Um, so yes, I'm looking at the a question here. Okay, we'll get to that. Uh, exactly, engaging board members. And so actually, this is a way, right, um, to whether or not leaders want to serve on your board depends greatly on impact, right? And what's, what is the board actually doing? What are you actually doing? Are we doing more than just meeting? Um, and when we do meet, how meaningful, how impactful are they? How relevant is it? What's the work? What am I actually supposed to do here? Are we getting anything done? right? No one wants to come and spend two hours talking about tablecloths, <laughs> right? Um, and you're not necessarily using my expertise or we're not talking about anything. And so if your board meetings are not designed, all of the stuff that's um, past, right? How much of your board is present and future focus your board meetings and how much of your meetings are reporting on stuff that's already done? Because we don't really need to hear that, right? So again, you really want it to be forward, for, you know, forward focused, ideally. And so how do you need to shift so that, again, the board's work is being done at the board level and the staff work is being done at the staff level? Um, so when you think about the gears um, of whose role is it, it's everybody's role, right? Emphasis on the word role, and each person has a different component of that. As an individual board member, if you're a member of an ineffective board, you have a role, right? And a responsibility to speak up, to challenge yourself as a board, to say, 
hey, this, I've noticed that we've done this. Is it possible for us to do this? Hey, I'm really feeling like I'm going unutilized. Is there something more that I can do, right? As CEO and board president, right? You have a responsibility. The CEO, the executive director has a huge responsibility in ensuring that um, the board is aware of things and the, the matters that are most pressing. Um, the board president really navigates the life of the board and, and board members. If you're noticing board members that aren't attending um, or that aren't engaged, having those conversations, right? And then the full board, the work of that board, the health of the board usually rests with um, a governance committee. Uh, used to be nominating committees were really shifting to governance so that it's more than just getting people on the board and then the responsibility is done. No, how are we actually engaging our board members, right? From the, and that cultivation process to answer your question, Gregory, it really is like a full cycle of um, engaging and sort of onboarding board, board prospects, right? So you begin with the cultivation and everyone that you're interested in, right? They go from sort of cultivation to really application or prospect, but all everyone that you're cultivating may or may not go to application or to engagement but you've got kind of a process, whether that's you know, coming down for a tour, um, attending an event, possibly joining um, a work group or a committee, or just kind of brainstorming about a particular issue, plugging them into the life of the organization, which of course means your organization has to have some life going on and some ways to do this. Um, you know, sharing with them what it looks like, what it means to be on a board, inviting them to a board meeting, really, really important so that they get a feel and a sense for what that looks like and they can assess whether that makes sense for them or not. Um, that your application process is asking, you know, how do you show up in a team? What are you really looking for? Um, that it's not just a resume builder for them, um, but what are you looking for? Um, how can you best serve this organization? If you, you know, when you sort of complete your assessment of what you need, hopefully the people that you're, you know, recruiting they fulfill more than one checkbox, right? So maybe they're black and an accountant with experience in fundraising, or um, you know, said oftentimes we say, well, we need a lawyer. Well, what kind of lawyer? Where are you going strategically as an organization? Are you going to be leasing a facility, um, a new building? So you need contract law. Are you going to be, um, you know? there's all kind of law, right? So just because they're a divorce attorney does not necessarily help you um, unless you're a relationship serving organization and your clients need that service. So really being specific about what you're looking for and then making sure you're asking and being um, upfront with the person that this is the service that we're looking for and how we want you to serve. Are you interested in doing that? Because sometimes people you know, um, I coach and talk for a living all day. I don't usually want to talk a lot in the evening. I'm an introvert. So I would not necessarily volunteer um, to do more coaching because I coach for a living all day. So when if I volunteer, I want to do, I might just want to rock babies or something completely contrary to what I do professionally. Um, so all of those things. And then once they're on the board, having a really strong orientation process that introduces the financials, that introduces the culture, that introduces those tensions we've been talking about um, so that they sort of understand it. And again, plugging them in, right? Um, lots of things to think about there. Okay, next question. Oh, so good. Such a good question. So the question is, what if the board abdicates their governance role to the ED and doesn't do the work? Uh, happens. <laughs> happens. I don't know if I have that slide in here, but there's definitely um, different ways of governing, right? There's governance as attendance, right, where the board generally just shows up, but they're basically rubber stamping. 
Um, this happens and you're, you're, you can be pretty prone to this for a founder um, led organization or a really long tenured ED in place um, where, you know, um, they've been in place and really the board is just kind of there um, because it has to be, again, back to symptom number one. Um, and it's tricky business making the organizational shift. We've done that um, a few times and it, it's not, it's pain, can be painful, um, but it's possible again, because as board members, you have a responsibility. And generally speaking, all CEOs and executives know that. So it's really about how the board is showing up, right? Um, individual board members are showing up and what questions you're asking, right? Do you have an interest in leading a governance committee? Um, sometimes sharing, hey, I attended this workshop and I think we have some work to do in this area. I'd like to, you know, volunteer to serve on this role or to be on this committee. Um, you know, it's, it's something you know, uh, this actually goes to the third area. <laughs> it's actually a great, uh, great segue um, to the third symptom, which is effectively addressing the human element. This one really, really um, hurts our organizations. Um, and this can be um, people staying in the role too long, um, people not attending, haven't attended in a long time, and we don't actually get them off the board. Um, all kinds of people, destructive people in board meetings, um, bad behavior. This can be um, people with um, views that are harmful to our values, um, bias and, and things of that nature that show up that don't get addressed, right? In the spirit of silence is violence. Um, yeah, so I would say usually by the time, you know, we get called in, it's because this kind of thing has been rampant in an organization and, you know, people are struggling, leaders are struggling with how to navigate it. And most of the time it's been going on for a long time, right? We know that change needs to happen, but change management is really about the human side of change, right? Um, to actually get an organization to change, the humans in the organization have to do something different. And most of the time, we all know we need change in the organization, but if I got to do something different, or if we got to change the meeting time, or you want me to come another time or something like that, then my hand goes down. And that could be really challenging um, to lead and to manage, particularly when it's a volunteer role. Can we talk about that, right? It's not so much volunteer, it's a responsibility. It's a legal responsibility to represent to the public. It's like almost like public office. It, it really is um, because you are elected um, to represent to the public that the in exchange for their charitable gift and exemption from taxes, that this organization is being well um, that the resources are being well managed, that we're doing this work in an um, equitable, just, fair way that actually fulfills the mission. And that often comes with stuff. <laughs> stuff. So it takes courage to actually stand up and do that work um, at the individual level, at the board level, at the community level. Um, as a network, right, and resources. Again, as I said, we are actually moving beyond just a single board in a single organization. The issues that are impacting our community are so much bigger than any one great dynamic CEO or one great organization can handle 
on their own. So we actually are getting to a place where we need governance inside of governance, right? That we've got to hear from those who are most impacted. They've got to be at the table. Um, they've got to be engaged and a part of the process to really make this work and to be effective um, is, is really, really critical. I'm looking here at another question. Give me one second. Uh, yes, talking about mentoring, um, another way to sort of cultivate new board members um, once they are oriented and onboarding is to actually have board buddies, um, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, some people, he's saying that, you know, some people have a waiting period before board members jump in and actually get fully engaged. So I love the idea of board buddies. Um, I'm not as enthusiastic about you know, waiting period as much, right? So why? Because um, their legal responsibility, their fiduciary responsibility doesn't wait, right? Again, particularly when it may be kind of a toxic or difficult environment to finesse, you know, I think that's where I think of a quality orientation um, process, which if you're small and you're only bringing in one person at a time or one or two people, you know, it's as simple as a meeting or a series of meetings, right? You can really, there, you can be creative in how you structure it, um, but you still need to be comprehensive in, um, you know, that they understand the program fully, they understand the financials fully, they understand the legal components, they understand the sources of funding, um, and the strategic plan and the core questions impacting the organization, because you want competent leaders from the community coming in and contributing um, their gift, their diversity, their expertise, and you want them to be able to jump in and serve and act really right away. Like if you're recruiting solid folks, right, and you're able to do that because you have done the work to actually ensure your board is relevant, that it's fulfilling its role, that it's not just going through the motions, right? And that you are intentional about addressing chronic people stuff, right? Then it's, there's no reason why I can't come in and have a direct impact. That's why you recruited them in the first place. So um, I don't necessarily love waiting because um, you want great people and um, you've got them. So put them to work right away, I say, um, because usually there's a term limit and a time limit, um, you know. So, yeah, I think um, so there's a question around um, equity and the power imbalances. Um, so let me see this. <sighs> How it can be addressed that serve Black people but may have key white people in board positions or executive leadership roles. Yeah, I think that that was, we didn't actually get to that because I'm um, in a, as well as I would have liked to. Um, and I'll just leave this up for your reference because we talked about the board building cycle. But when it comes to, you know, again, it goes back to the notion of responsibility. Regard whether you are black or white, right? There are, I have been and I have worked with, you know, I've been a black CEO leading a black organization run by an almost exclusively white board. I've been a black CEO leading a black organization run and led by a black, you know, almost exclusively black board. Um, and several combinations as an interim CEO in between. The dynamics can be um, helpful or harmful, really, um, particularly for Black serving organizations. It is imperative, right, that we are able to have the conversations and that the distribution, again, of power, um, that again, that it's that white supremacist view that the board is top, they hire the chief, the chief is top, they hire senior leadership, the leadership is top, they hire managers, the managers are top, the staff are here, the staff are here, we serve clients or help or fix clients. Um, 
is not the way the world works, right? You could actually significantly invert that whole system and turn it on its head, and we should, and we should, because you, if that, in that model, you are making decisions from a vantage point for which you have no relationship, no frame of reference, and you're doing two instead of, and make, like, it's time out for that. And that can cause, right? And I, I have been in this position trying to share and explain to a, an, a, a board that doesn't get it <laughs> why this doesn't make sense. And that is harmful to leaders, to people, to communities. Right. And so we as an organization, as a community, as a sector have to resist and um, fight back against that. Um, it's 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 be, we're beyond just diversity. Right. We're beyond having black and white, you know, representation on the board. Um, it's bigger than that, right? It's diversity of thought, of perspective, of vantage point, but we want to be equitable and ensuring that our programming, our leadership, our how we are serving is inclusive and informed and fair and just, right? To those that were doing it. Um, great question, let's see. COVID, okay. Oh, yeah, so COVID created a distraction. The question is, how do I bring folks back um, from, from distractions? Um, the distract, not distract, I mean, you know, to be sensitive, but um, COVID came in and, you know, board members have sort of been focused on a lot of stuff, personally and professionally, depending on where they are and such that the organization may not necessarily um, be the priority um, and not wanting to you know, add to an already difficult situation. Um, and what I would say to that, and I, I, I have a lot of organizations that have, you know, um, in the philanthropic sector in particular, you know, that typically have met quarterly, um, generally speaking, in person for a day or two, and obviously now we're not meeting in person at all. Um, some are serving maybe community foundations, and communities have major, major issues, and so that organization um, is not necessarily priority. Um, I think that, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's relationships, and um, meeting the need and being flexible in how we respond. Um, and so if you are accustomed to quarterly full day meetings, maybe now, right, you're doing snippets, um, you're doing um, six times or not even necessarily having or feeling the pressure of putting how frequently it is, but what is the business that needs to be done and centering around that, right? That's where maybe the committees are meeting um, on particular issues and the full meeting is, you know, less frequent, um, but more um, potent, right? Again, what are the key questions that you have and how can you sort of shift, right? So, so doing it the same way that it was before, um, may not be um, in the best interest of the organization at this time, but what does the organization need now and how do we need to shift? Having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your board chair about it and then having your board chair reach out and have a conversation um, with the full board. Sometimes picking up the good old-fashioned telephone, um, you know, email, woo Oh my gosh, right? So many emails and information overload. It's not always that people are intentionally being non-responsive. Um, it's just a lot of information coming at us. And so being able to just kind of pick up the phone sometimes um, to connect and even share, hey, I'm having difficulty getting us back together. 
When do you think your calendar will be clear? Do you need a pause, right? Those kinds of conversations and really just having them directly um, and addressing them directly is really um, helpful, I would say, in the interest of the organization. All right. Um, so I would say in summary, when you are thinking about building a better board, looking at the board that you have now and really give, having a heart to heart about what might be holding you back. It might be going through the motions. It might be focusing on the wrong thing. It might be a human element or it may be something different. I'd love for you all to just share back with me of those three things. If you can think about your board's greatest challenge um, right now, does it fall into one of those buckets or is it something different? And then really courageously figuring out how in our system can we address this so that we become more impactful to the organization and to the community and also um, to ourselves and holding ourselves accountable. But what is it? What's your greatest challenge? And does it fall in one of those three or is it something different? That's kind of a final reflection question. And how do you tackle it? How do you tackle it? I see someone saying all three. Got it. It's doable though. I think the good thing about it is that why I said it was solvable symptoms, right? I often say you have to name it to tame it. Um, it doesn't often happen overnight, but there are um, so many resources. I am a certified governance trainer with BoardSource. Um, which is a resource that we use regularly. They have really, really great resources, many of them um, free um, templates for um, committee charters and job descriptions and um, lots and lots of um, available resources that, again, it's not one size fits all, but you take those starting templates to get people's you know, juices flowing and then you talk about what's really happening within our board um, and what's happening here. And then voila, you will be on the road towards recovery and being more effective. Yes, yes. How much time to spend on the present versus the future. Good, good, good. Thank you all for talking to me. I feel so lonely when I don't have to get the chance to interact. <laughs> Got it. I see most people saying that there's useful in all three, maybe starting with one. Yeah, definitely don't try to tackle it all. You know, you can also kind of prioritize and again, working in concert with your governance committee or your executive committee, or if it's just you and the board chair, the two of you can tackle it, um, or if it's just the executive committee, right? Um, but you can start somewhere, uh, it's all doable. Thank you all. Brandon's back. <laughs> I'm back, I am back. So I want to thank you, Marissa. This was fantastic. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Marissa, you need to get familiar with Marissa. Like I said at the beginning, she's kind of a big deal. Um, <laughs> she trains across the country. Uh, it was a treat to have you today. Uh, for those of you that know me or have been watching the webinar series since we started with uh, COVID-19 related uh, sessions in June, you know I always like to leave folks with some uh, free resources. So I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm gonna go through a couple things really, really quickly. So the first thing I want you guys to notice is that when you go to our website, and Marissa, you can see the website, correct? I can. Okay, there's a link here at the very top. It says COVID-19 resources. I know that came up as a question. You'll notice that we have compiled a huge list of things. Some of these are funders, some of these are just tracking sources about how people can learn how to pivot. Uh, there's some legislation information, which I hope by now most of you have become familiar with. There are some really, really interesting conversations happening around philanthropy and equity right now. And I would definitely suggest 
that you uh, become familiar with these things. Uh, Marissa also brought a board soy, so I pulled up the website. If you haven't become familiar with this, it's been around for a long time. I can't imagine a time when I've been involved with nonprofit work that board source wasn't around. They have a tremendous, tremendous amount of resources. Um, there's a really, really great article on nonprofit quarterly right now called What is Governance? The Best Practices for Boards. There's a huge list of additional articles that you can read on that. And finally, there was a question about how to engage board members during this very special time. Uh, I would encourage you to do two things, which is to go back to our website, watch the webinar series that we did specifically related to COVID-19. And finally, uh, we've been talking about this a lot. There are a lot of companies that are stepping up to the plate and offering discounted services, but in general, TechSoup always has um, a large just plethora of a catalog of companies that it works with to offer access to things that you might not normally be able to afford or in this particular time find it difficult to afford. Um, you can see that the discounted rates for, for an, annual, an annual subscription to Zoom are really, really deeply discounted here um, through TechSoup. So again, these are some great resources uh, for all of you. Um, I want to thank you for being with us. Our next session, I believe, is on program design. Um, you can go to our website or to our Facebook page to find those things. Last but not least, Marissa will give me her slide deck that'll be on the website. You'll be able to access that. This recording will end up on our YouTube channel. You'll be able to go directly to that or you can view it by going back to where we, we seat all the webinars after they've aired. Uh, again, I wanna thank you, Marissa, for joining us. This is fantastic. Um, I really, really enjoyed that first table that shows kind of like the evolution of boards and what they need. Um, it's very concise. I ask you guys to really take some time, look back at the slide deck and uh, challenge your board members. You know, they have a responsibility to be there for you. Uh, and those of us that are in executive leadership have a responsibility to work well with them. And that's something that we have to put the time in, right? It doesn't happen by magic. Again, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, this is the end of the session, and we will see you in a week. Take care. Bye.